What is the Belt and Road? In very short, it's a multi-level ambitious project promoted by China, and it's a very interesting example of how a modern third state employs historical uh, discourses of old trans transcontinental roads uh, in order to argue the strategic necessity for establishing new networks in Eurasia and beyond. And uh, a special importance uh, in the implementation of the Belt and Road Initiative has been attached to the Central Asian states in particular. China regards them as the key element uh, of the successful Birai progress in the future. When talking about the developments of the Belt and Road Initiative in Central Asia, I argue that so far there has been four several stages. For historians, it's probably better to call these periods of the Birai implementation in the region. Uh, these periods are, the first is the period of preconditions and taking off, the second, the period of putting out fillers to prospective partners, the third period is the period of preparing the groundwork, and finally the ongoing period of adjustments of the Belt and Road Initiative. If we talk about the first one, the preconditions and taking off of the Belt and Road, uh, we can cover the uh, events before 2013, before the Belt and Road was launched. By that time, uh, China became one of the main trade partners of the Central Asian states, and it secured a comprehensive strategic partnership which, with each state in the region. And all major bilateral agreements between China and these states were uh, focused on economic issues. However, not everything went, went smoothly because bef before 2013. Uh, there were both contradictions between China and Central Asian states on bilateral level and within the SCO on multilateral level. For example, if we talk about the bilateral levels, there were um, contradictions on the railway, railway construction. On the multilateral levels, um, the, not every Central Asian state, so, state was supporting the idea of the economic, um, economic, the adjustment of economic cooperation between China and Central Asian states and Russia also within the SCO framework. So China needed something else, something, something, some new mechanism uh, in order to make it more appealing for the Central Asian states. And here the narrative on the Asian Silk Road, which connected civilizations, connected China and outer space, contributing to the mutual development, became very, uh, worked very well for China. The second period is the period of putting off fillers. It's a very short time in between 2014-2015. Um, China officially suggested the Belt and Road Initiative for the Central Asian states in particular, but in a very general form, and there were no any white papers or any other official documents on that. And uh, so far there was high uncertainty about this new project and China was waiting for the response from the Central Asian states. So while talking about this particular period we should speak mostly about how the Central Asian states perceived the Belt and Road and how they started to respond. In the region the Belt and Road Initiative, or on that time the Silk Road Economic Belt project, was perceived as corresponding with local needs to promote international transit roads and attract more much-needed investments in the region to dissolve existing economic and social problems. Um, Belt and Road Initiative implied no spe specific um, political requirements to fulfill, and this is also what was very attractive for the Central Asian regimes, uh, which wanted to keep in power. The four official discourses on the Belt and Road Initiative at that time were all very positive, and if we talk about the academic discourses, which started to appear throughout the region, they were both positive, but some uh, experts were also covering possible dangers for the, for the Central Asian states and the um, dependency of, the, of, each state, of each state in the region on, on China in the future. The third period, preparing the groundwork, is the period in between 2015 and 2018. Uh, for the first time, China came up with the official white paper on the Belt and Road Initiative in 2015, and uh, later on, um, Belt and Road became more actively articulated in the official discourse of China, and it even uh, was uh, put in the 
um, constitution of the Communist Party of China later during the 19th Party Congress. It all meant that the uh, that Belt and Road became a very important part of China's policy making for the future. Among the external factors which started to influence the Belt and Road implementation in the region were um, the start of the US-China strategic competition at that time, also the Russian factor. Russia became again more active in the region and in the um, end of 2016 uh, even placed Central Asian states, those who were the members of the Eurasian Economic Union and the Collective Security Treaty Organization, among the most uh, important states in the foreign security policy concept in the post-Soviet space. And third, uh, there were also internal uh, changes within the region, such as the change of power in Uzbekistan and later the start of the new um, rapprochement process in the region initiated by Uzbekistan and supported by Kazakhstan mostly and other states in the region. So if we talk about the BRI in that time, uh, China started to put even more investments um, in the region, especially to big states, uh, key states in the region, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And uh, if we try to explore the actual correlation between the multilateral and bilateral cooperation in between China and the states of the region, uh, mainly, again, the cooperation was uh, uh, promoted at the bilateral level, and uh, the majority of the um, the majority <coughs> of uh, the uh, projects which have been started were already the projects initiated before the Belt and Road was proposed. Uh, some of them were successful, for example, the Line C of the Central Asian uh, Gas Pipeline. Some of them were not successful at all, for example, Line D or the Kyrgyzstan, uh, China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan Railway. And finally, if we speak about the last uh, period, the ongoing period of the BRI adjustments, this is also very interesting because China. Uh, being aware of the critique uh, about the Belt and Road Initiative and the, especially about the, criti the critique on the China's loans to the Central Asian states, China's geopolitical ambitions in the region, uh, China um, and some corrupt practices of gaining advantages of the businesses in the region, uh, still had to continue putting efforts into making Belt and Road Initiative more um, more um, uh, more appealing for the Central Asian states. And uh, during the second Belt and Road Forum uh, two months ago in Beijing, uh, China started to bring more, bring up a deeper, more concrete discourse on the Belt and Road. Uh, this particular period, there were new factors of influence within the Central Asia, such as uh, Again, the political transition in the region, in Kazakhstan in particular in this time, further rapprochement of the states within the region, and again the Russian factor. And also if we talk about this uh, stage, there were also some changes within China, because China started to be, to be more active on the fight against terrorism and issued the White Paper in the spring of 2018 on fighting against terrorism in Xinjiang. And there also the issue of the so-called vocational centers in Xinjiang appeared. And uh, the question of refugees escaping from Xinjiang to Central Asian states became one more uh, important issue of relations in between China and the states. Although the official response of the Central Asian states, in particular of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, to this issue was positive um, because uh, they, re they all officially regarded this issue as China's internal uh, question, but at the same time it started to cause further public response uh, from the Central Asian um, from the Central Asian population about what's going on inside Xinjiang and how it can affect the situation in Central Asia in particular. Um, by the time when the Belt and Road was launched in Central Asia, China's presence in the region uh, had already been very impressive. All of the Central Asian states, although to different degrees, had become significantly dependent on their commercial and financial ties uh, with China. For example, up to 2013, Kazakhstan became, uh, for Kazakhstan, China became the second largest trade partner after Russia. And one-fourth, uh, 25% of, uh, of its oil was produced by China, and one-fifth of its oil import, exports, 20% uh, was uh, being sold to China. 
Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan were also very highly dependent on China at the time. More than 50% of the imported goods came to the states from China, and China's share in the foreign debt was already 35% for Kyrgyzstan and 50% for Tajikistan, respectively. Turkmenistan also became highly dependent on uh, exporting its gas to China. More than 60% of its gas was already being sold to its uh, eastern partner. Uzbekistan also experienced the rate of Chinese investments into infrastructural products, which was good for Uzbekistan. But at the same time, they were continuing to sell the raw materials uh, to China, again being dependent on this uh, kind of collaboration. During uh, my answer to the first question, I mentioned four different stages. So if we talk about the second stage of the BRI implementation, 2014-2015, um, People Republic of China and its economic influence in Central Asia has become even more observable in each state of the Central Asia. And uh, China secured its position as the largest investor in all of the five states, the largest creditor except from Kazakhstan, and the largest for Turkmenistan or sec second trading partner, which was really a very important uh, for the Central Asian state at that time. During the third period, 2016-2018, China's economic role became especially significant for Turkmenistan, because Turkmenistan before uh, sold part of its gas to Russia, but after the start of the economic sanctions against Russia in early 2010s, um, there were tensions in between Russia and Turkmenistan on the prices of gas, and Turkmenistan uh, stopped selling gas to Russia, and after that it had to sell more gas to China for lower prices, which was uh, which lowered benefits for Turkmenistan itself, since the gas exports accounted for 80% of government's revenues and 35% of the country's GDP. So it all exacerbated internal economic problems in Turkmenistan in particular, and it was a really huge dependence on its ties with China. For other states in the region, uh, during this particular period, dependence on the Chinese markets remained a challenge because mineral, mineral resources continued to be one of the major uh, export items of each of the states. Also, during the third stage, we can speak about a new dimension on chi of China's involvement in the region because for the first time China launched the so-called quadrilateral cooperation and coordination mechanism in between itself, uh, Turkmen uh, Tajikistan, Pakistan and Afghanistan. So for the first time, Tajikistan, who was a member of collective security treaty organization led by Russia, was involved in another cooperation mechanism with uh, some uh, military and political military agenda uh, with China. And it was uh, not in the framework of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It was something new. Uh, China became a potential security provider for the Central Asian states and for Tajikistan in particular on this particular stage. And if we talk about the last stage, the ongoing cooperation between China and Central Asian states and the implementation of the Belt and Road, um, we can just see the continuation of these processes. So the economic dependency and the uh, start of the security provision for the Central Asian states. And it will be very interesting to see how the situation is going to evolve in the future. And first, if we speak about the challenges of the Belt and Road implementation for China itself in Eurasia, first of all, it's very interesting to see how China will try to combine its um, uh, will to follow the market principles and rely only on mostly on commercial funds for financing the BRI projects in the future, with uh, the need to institutionalize, institutionalize the Belt and Road and its implementation and again, to follow the China Communist Party constitution set goals to promote the Belt and Road as one of the biggest objectives for China's foreign policy in the future. Also for China, one ch another challenge is uh, the need to combine the narratives of uh, big family, good neighborliness, and success story of turning into rich while being poor previously, with the necessity to create a positive image of China in many countries, especially in those neighboring states where the image of China has been hostile for centuries. So this is also very interesting to see how China is going to adjust to this. 
Um, if we talk about the challenges for other states in Eurasia, first of all, there is this dilemma of sovereignty. And we all know that the Belt and Road is being sold under the flag of being apolitical, and the emphasis input is putting it on the principles of non-interference and territor territorial integrity. The question is how far the engagement within the Belt and Road may go for the states of Eurasia, and where is this red line for accepting the proposed projects? Uh, under the Belt and Road auspices. For example, uh, again, if we speak about the Central Asian states, there is this possibility of militarization of the Belt and Road-inspired projects. Uh, China, in case of the deterioration of the situation in Afghanistan, will need to <clears throat> secure its pipelines in Central Asia. And the question is whether China is going to use its military force for it in the future or how else it's going to be implemented. Also, there are <clears throat> there is information now about the Chinese military base in Tajikistan. So this is one more proof of China going out with not only its economic policies, but also with its uh, political and military agenda. Also, another challenge for the other uh, Eurasian states is the question of the indigenous populations in many Eurasian states. And um, the Chinese state supported need to implement the Belt and Road and uh, popularize the idea of mutual equality and mutual respect. And at the same time, um, there is this uh, potential clash of the new space cooperation with ethnic and religious nationalism. A lot have been said about the case of Xinjiang and the Uyghur question and the relationship between the states and the population within the context of the bureau can also become more tense in case of uh, public uh, the public not non-acceptance of the Belt and Road projects. We can see the situation in the Central Asian states again. We also can see it, the negative perception of Chinese coming with the projects to other states in many other states in Eurasia, for example, in Eastern Europe, in the Caucasus, in Southeast Asia, and so on and so forth. And finally, one more challenge is the problem of the definition of the Belt and Road. It is still blurred and unclear, but at the same time, it's flexible while being blurred and unclear. And it allows new things to be put inside the projects. So this is both challenge and potential. The potential is that anything can be added toward the BRI in the future, and if something goes not very good, China can add other things on the agenda. For example, it all it it, it was done before with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, starting from 2001 and later. But this will not show the success of this project. This is just so the adjustment the adjustment of. Uh, China's foreign policy towards the acceptance again or non-acceptance of the Belt and Road. And the challenge about the blurriness again is about the implementation of the Belt and Road. How it's going to be uh, done uh, on the field in each state which is being interested into uh, becoming a partner of China in this particular field.